Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, Yvette Clark, Congresswoman for New York's 9th Congressional District, my district. Plus, more on blockchain and cryptocurrency as the so-called South by Southwest of blockchain heads to NYC. Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Ashley Ford, and they did it. Brooklyn Friends of the NRA finally held their meeting. After two cancellations. After two. Hi, Ashley. Nice to be with you today. Lovely to be with you too, Ross. Uh, yeah, uh, two venues backed out. They finally found a third. It was the Knights of Columbus, a Catholic fraternal organization in Diker Heights. Mm -hmm. um, there were protesters, of course. And there was a report on a Twitter that actually they may have even registered under a fake name to kind of mm. get under the radar. Um, unclear if they held their gun raffle. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is how they raise their money. Their important PAC money, Political Action Committee, mm. um, comes from members and individual donations like the ones happening here. So there you have it. They held it. They raised their money. And if we can opprobrium aside, you know, they'll <laughs> go on their way. They'll do their thing. Any thoughts? This is really interesting to me because a little further afield in Dallas, Mike Pence, the vice president, uh, will be attending an NRA convention and guns will be prohibited, as well as knives, right? Yeah, guns, w knives, weapons. So like guns are a problem? It sounds like they're a problem. And I mean, if this is at an NRA meeting and the NRA are supposedly the good guys with the guns, why are we concerned about there being guns there when the president is there? Wouldn't the good guys the vice just... President, vice president. The vice president. Wouldn't they just take care of him? Right. I mean, guns can't be the problem, right? Why would you just prohibit guns? But it is the Secret Service who says we don't want all the guns mm. there. But still, it feels like a little bit... If the Secret Service doesn't want to deal <laughs> with guns, then it makes me think... Why should kids in schools have to deal with people bringing in guns? Good point. I think there's a solution to all of this. And mm. maybe it's not just selectively banning guns at certain events where dignitaries mm. go, but maybe maybe there's something else that could be done. You might hmm. be onto something. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Well, we'll yeah. have to get back to that. We you have never to think know. about it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and then, did you see there was this meeting? This was also um, last week. Uh, uh, talking about the MTA, it was an event to kind of discuss the future of the subways in the city. It was interrupted by a protest of individuals, um, disabled rights activists, mm -hmm. who uh, I guess less than a quarter of the city's subways actually have handicap access. Yes. Access for people in wheelchairs. Um, yes. Otherwise, people who are otherwise challenged getting down stairways. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever encountered uh, such a thing. Well, Ross, I don't know if you know this about me, but I moved to New York on crutches. Mm -hmm. I tore my ACL two weeks before mm -hmm. I moved to the city. So I did all my apartment hunting, uh, new job finding, and exploring on crutches the yeah. first month or so that I lived here. Actually, a little longer. And you weren't just and taking I, Ubers around? I was not. I could not afford to just take Ubers around constantly. And I found myself in a lot of tricky situations trying to crutch myself up steps <laughs> upon steps upon steps in the city and looking for elevators that I couldn't find. It's a complete absurdity. I don't get it. I've been in a situation, I mean, you know, fortunately, I you know, am able-bodied and can go up and down stairs uh, when I need to. One time, though, I was carrying a whole bunch of camera equipment, trying to find a way to get down to my train in Penn Station. Mm -hmm. And you want to spend as little time in Penn Station whenever you're in Penn Station. Yes. And I was doing circles around that whole place, trying to find a way to get down. And finally, they just had to clonk them down the stairs. And But if you go to a place, and sometimes you, you take elevators, and they only lead to then those jaws turnstiles, oh, yeah. right? And so imagine if you go up an elevator and you're there, and then how do you get out? You can get stuck. It's really um, unacceptable. So I can understand their anger, and they, they shut down this mm -hmm. whole whole talk. So I think good for them. Good for them. Um, Speaking of anger, I got to say, I'm pretty upset, personally. Um, HUD and Ben Carson proposed an increase in the amount paid by those receiving assistance with rent for housing. Roughly speaking, it would go from 30% of their gross income to 35%. Now, I have never lived in low-income housing. I was very lucky to live in a place with really affordable housing, um, but my mother worked hard, and my mother worked for the government. 
And if she lived here, if we lived here, we would absolutely have been eligible for low-income housing. And when I think about his reasoning and the reasons that Ben Carson gave for this, mm -hmm. which were essentially that when you give people higher standards, then they reach for mm -hmm. higher standards. Um, it feeds into the idea that people who are living in poverty or in any sort of lower socioeconomic situations mm -hmm. just don't have the same desire for things that people who aren't, people who are middle class, people who are wealthy, that we don't have the same desire, we don't have the same um, call mm. to try harder, right. to do better, to better ourselves, cool. you know, which is a real... Um, Pick yourself by, up by your own bootstraps. Picking yourself up by the bootstraps, right. which is bullshit. Uh, <laughs> it is, especially for people who don't have boots. Yeah. Um, there's that, and then there's also the fact that, you know, the thing that comes to mind for me over and over is that a lot of these people are drowning or barely treading water. And when someone is drowning in a room, it does not help to make the ceiling higher. Mm. It helps to remove some of the water. Right, right. And this is not a water removing proposal. This mm. is a ceiling heightening proposal, well, and it's not gonna help anyone. I think you, you, you phrased it well on Twitter when you said Ben Carson doesn't understand the difference between a war on poverty and a war on the poor. Yes. And I think this, this also had some kind of Orwellian name attached to it, right? Am I right? In the control room? The Make, make Affordable, thank you in the control room, Make, the, make Affordable Housing Work Act, or MAHUA, uh, I guess. Uh, Sounds which is terrible. Which a MAHUA. 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 Stop. Uh, <laughs> Mahuaful. It sounds <laughs> mahuaful. Um, somebody crunched the numbers and it looks like it could be up to 400,000 people currently living in NYCHA who mm -hmm. could be affected by this increase. You know, meanwhile, you know, Scott Pruitt is flying around in first class giving raises Listen. to his, his staffers and his appointees, paying $43,000 for a soundproof box in his office, although he wasn't aware that that was happening, that they were constructing this thing in his office somehow without his, his hmm. knowledge. Interesting. Um, this is kind of part of Trump's um, history of a hostility to welfare. Back in 1973, he and his father, Fred Trump, they were sued by the Department of Justice for violating the Fair Housing Act. Uh, they had been discriminating on who they would allow um, to purchase apartments or condos in their buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent in uh, a couple of sort of test cases. They sent in a, a white woman, or first they sent in a black woman, said, hey, do you guys have anything available? They said, no, sorry. Then they sent a white woman in and they said, sure, would you like to pick between this place or this place? And gave mm -hmm. her a couple options. Uh, and then there was also this quote um, from him back in, in 87. He said, what we didn't do was rent to welfare cases, white or black. We're going to speak about this and more with Yvette Clark, who'll join us shortly. She's the congresswoman for New York's 9th District, which covers much of central Brooklyn and my home. And then we're going to meet with co-founder of the upcoming Ethereal Summit to learn more about cryptocurrency and smart contracts. Don't snooze on this. It's the future. Or so we're told. Even though I still can't get my head around it. Stay tuned. It's a seat that's been occupied by many luminaries of New York City politics, like Joseph Pulitzer and Geraldine Ferraro when the seat was in Queens. Or Chuck Schumer and Anthony Weiner after it moved to Brooklyn. It's New York's ninth congressional district, and now it's occupied by Yvette Clark. She follows in the footsteps of another Brooklynite, Shirley Chisholm, who became the first black woman elected to the U.S. Congress in 1968. We're excited to have Congresswoman Clark with us today to talk about what's going on in D.C. and in her Brooklyn district. Congresswoman, welcome to 112BK. Well, thank you for having me, Ashley. It's We're great so to be happy with you. To have you. Can you talk to me a little bit about growing up in Brooklyn? Because you're a real Brooklynite. I'm a new one, but you are through and through. Absolutely. Born in Brooklyn Jewish Hospital, mm -hmm. attended all of my formative educational years in Brooklyn. Uh, just a product mm -hmm. of a a wonderful community during a time when the village indeed did 
help to raise the child. And uh, coming out of an activist household, mm -hmm. civic-minded, engaged in everything around us. And I believe it's because, you know, my parents are immigrants to the United States. They came from the beautiful island nation of Jamaica. Yeah. And one way for them to make sure that my brother and I would be able to really uh, help them achieve the American dream was navigating, mm -hmm. knowing who all the important people were, if you will, in terms mm -hmm. of education education, in terms of uh, addressing the concerns of raising children in a new place and building neighborhood uh, uh, affinity, if you will, oh, so absolutely. that we could have uh, a safe space in which to really grow and to be nourished and to uh, feel a part of a wonderful community. And so, uh, that's my recollections growing up, a uh, lifelong resident of the district that I represent, from Sunday school to public school. Right. I've done it all in the 9th Congressional District. And what was it that made you realize you wanted to go into politics? You know, I talked to Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor of Georgia just last week, and she talked about being raised in a very service-minded household, and that's how she ended up in politics. And it was similar for you, right? Absolutely. I, I was going to concur with that completely. Mm -hmm. Service. Um, I was in a, raised in a household where uh, it was not enough just for my family to navigate, but to make sure that all of our neighbors were safely navigating the bureaucracies of, of a city, uh, understanding how we could undergird and support one another, and knowing that whatever I was able to accomplish, I had an obligation to give back. And so, uh, it, it's just growing up in that environment where neighbors were helping neighbors, where we helped to elect uh, a whole host of uh, elected officials in central Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom would hold art shows at our home wow. to help raise money, uh, hold barbecues. Uh, she was engaged in everything from the PTA to the Block Association meeting. Wow. And I was, you know, her mini-me. Right. Uh, there wasn't daycare during those days, so wherever my mom went uh, to be engaged with her peers, she would take me and my brother along. We'd sit quietly in the corner. And while you're sitting quietly in the corner, you're observing a lot. Absolutely. Uh, and you're absorbing a lot, uh, seeing how people are addressing uh, real challenges mm -hmm. and how they plotted um, their courses of action. Uh, that all fed into me a, a, a very uh, passionate uh, affinity for mm. the people uh, that I now currently represent. Wow. And what an example from your mother. What a beautiful example. Exactly. Can you tell me, what was it like when—because I know your mother served in the city council. Absolutely. Uh, what was it like for you to serve in the city council? What was that experience? It was a great experience. Uh, that was my first foray into elective office. Mm -hmm. And the city council is literally where the rubber meets the road. That's where you're able to see your direct impact on the lives of the people that you represent and, and the city at large. And so, uh, con uh, connecting with a whole host of other new members, because uh, that was the first class of uh, elected council members mm. that were elected after term limits, it said it. Oh, and wow. so I think there were like uh, at least 30 other uh, new members at that time, all mm -hmm. of us coming together around common cause uh, to do what we felt was in the best interest of the people of the city of New York. And so it was a great learning ground how to legislate, how to advocate, how to get along with colleagues uh, to build consensus mm -hmm. around policy that we knew would have an impact on mm -hmm. New Yorkers. Building consensus. Absolutely. That's always that's the challenge. It is. What are your thoughts about the makeup of the city council? Like, do you see a certain trajectory there? Well, one of the things that uh, is a little bit disturbing is to see uh, the drop off in the number of women mm. that are now in the New York City Council. Uh, we had. Uh, 
substantially more women in uh, the New York City Council when I was a member there. Mm -hmm. And uh, to see that that has fallen off a bit, uh, it's going to take uh, some real analysis to see why women are not stepping up in the way that they have in the past. Do you to, have any thoughts on why you think that might be? I don't know. I don't know. Um, perhaps they're not being asked, mm. you know? And, and they say that it takes a woman to be asked at least four times before she makes up her mind wow. to, to run. And so, you know, we, we have to continue to encourage uh, women to seek elective office. It's important that we have gender balance in uh, policy making because women come with a unique lens uh, mm -hmm. as to how to address the, the, the problems and the challenges that our communities face. Uh, many of our households are run uh, by uh, female headed households, oh, right? Absolutely. As female headed households. Yes. And so the decisions that women have to make on a daily basis should be reflected in the policies that uh, we're uh, developing to impact their lives. How different are the decisions you have to make on a daily basis now as a congresswoman from when you were a city council member? Well, there's far more bipartisanship mm. at the congressional level. The city council is uh, a one house body, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the Congress, you have the the House, the Senate, you have far more Republicans. I'm in a minority here, where I was right. in the majority during all of my time in the New York City Council, and so you develop new skills, mm -hmm. um, you develop ways of developing common cause uh, that are unique to the body that is the Congress, mm -hmm. um, and you're dealing with people from across the country as oh, across yeah. as opposed to across the city of New York. So, right. you, you know, I try to find common cause with uh, folks who are in rural America when I'm talking about uh, the deployment of broadband, for mm -hmm. instance, because in urban areas, we know that there has been a lethargic uh, uh, rollout. Oh, yeah. of uh, broadband to particularly communities of color, mm -hmm. uh, and rural communities are facing very similar challenges. So Absolutely. where I can find common cause uh, with unique places and spaces, mm -hmm. that's what I'm seeking to do. Uh, on the other hand, in the city council, it was a lot easier, I believe, uh, because uh, we are uh, so uh, unique. Uh, to come it's together easy around to be that uniqueness, like-minded, exactly. with the people there, so that you're all working toward. It's easier to find the common cause exactly. and the common goal. I would assume. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are some of the, you know, aside from broadband, which is an issue, mm -hmm. um, and you hear a lot about that in different uh, places in the borough. But what other issues are you working on right now that directly affect the district? Well, you know, number one is comprehensive immigration reform. Mm. Uh, and, and just uh, the way that there has been a constant assault on immigrants coming from the Trump administration. And uh, proposing legislation to uh, help to move us forward mm. uh, on the issue of immigration, whether it's DACA recipients or it's those who are here under temporary protected status, to groups of people who have been targeted directly, Absolutely. or it's, quite frankly, the Muslim ban mm -hmm. uh, that has really uh, sent uh, shockwaves through the 9th Congressional District. Right. These are all areas that I have been uh, outspoken, uh, have mm -hmm. legislated on, and I'm working to continue to build consensus in the House right. of Representatives around. It's just one issue. We can talk about health care and the Affordable Care Act, which was under assault uh, in the very beginning of the Trump administration, uh, through uh, public activism mm -hmm. and, and engagement alongside really progressive members of Congress. We were able to push back on it, but uh, certain elements of the Affordable Care Act have been undermined by this administration, yes, which absolutely. makes it less effective in helping us with things like the opioid crisis, right. which is something that I'm also legislating around right now. I have mm -hmm. a bill out. Um, so health care is very, very important to me and to our absolutely. constituency. And then, you know, the uh, affordable housing crisis. Mm. There's no doubt about it. I think at every level of government, it's been a vexing 
problem as we see so much development we taking do. place in central Brooklyn and finding it more and more difficult to help the homeless, to right. help those who are in moderate to low-income families mm -hmm. uh, find places uh, to remain in our communities. I'm very interested in this. Um, you're actually my representative. I don't oh, know if you know that because well. of where I live. Yes. Um, but one of the things that has been really deeply concerning to me lately, especially when I think about my neighbors, is some of the changes that we're seeing in the housing and urban development and that Secretary Ben Carson just announced. Um, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I, I listened to the analysis of how he wants to change HUD, and to be perfectly honest, what I hear is that people are going to be homeless. It's people are going to die. Like, this is going to become a crisis and in no way helpful for people who are actually living in poverty and desperately need affordable housing, especially in a city like New York. And you, and you add what Ben Carson is doing with HUD to what is, is being done in the uh, Congress around the Farm Bill mm -hmm. and for providing uh, food assistance to uh, those in need in our communities, and it's a perfect storm against the, po the, the those who uh, are living in poverty mm -hmm. in our nation. And, and so now it's time for us to fight. Right. Uh, we have to determine, as a civil society, how we want to live and fight for it, and mm -hmm. what our values are, and, 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 and how we're going to regain our moral compass after uh, dealing with these Republicans, quite frankly, in mm -hmm. Washington, who have lost it. They have no moral standing whatsoever, uh, could care less about those who are struggling to make ends meet, who mm -hmm. are looking for livable wages and can't find jobs that would provide them income security. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're in a battle right now. We're in a battle for the soul of America. And, you know, getting back to HUD and Ben Carson, you know, he's just one of several cabinet members who reflect the antithesis of the agencies, the mission of the agencies that they've been given charge over. I don't know how a pediatric brain surgeon could be mm. given such a responsibility for urban development, for housing, and for making sure that those who need us most in our society will have their needs met. Uh, clearly, that's not his mission. But I've introduced legislation. It's called the Hardest Hit Housing Act that mm -hmm. would enable uh, the agency to reinvest in affordable housing in a meaningful way, something we haven't done in over a generation, but needs to be done. Because what we're facing here in Brooklyn is actually being faced across this nation. The I mean, eviction rates across this country have skyrocketed. And there right hasn't now. been a, a real conversation about the role of the federal government in providing for the, the people who, who need housing. Now, talk to me about Scott Pruitt. Because I saw that you tweeted about him a little bit, um, that he should resign. Talk to me a little bit about your feelings there and why you feel like it, he it's needs a disgrace. To move on. I mean, uh, the, the, the breach of ethics that mm -hmm. uh, has come to light uh, should never uh, be uh, at all uh, accepted. No, absolutely not. You know, uh, this is a public servant. And his job is to serve the public. And I hear that. I feel like we keep hearing that, and I, f I feel the same way. But it also feels like nothing is happening. Well, there are to hopes the of investigations taking place right now. Right. Unfortunately, you know, well, we give people due process, right? We do. So, unfortunately, we're, we're just going to have to wait for the reports coming from the inspector general right. over at the EPA. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're going to be. Uh, 
more hearings on Capitol Hill. Uh, one was held last week with the Energy and Commerce Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, but aside from that, what he's doing in terms of rollbacks of uh, regulation yes. that provide us with clean air, clean water, that help us to, to, to really move into the 21st century, mm -hmm. uh, embracing renewable energy sources and mm -hmm. re, uh, reducing and eliminating our dependence on fossil fuels is, is an assault on the American people. Yeah. And so we've got a real problem here with Scott Pruitt. I Not agree. only his personal conduct and what he has done to disgrace his office, but what he's doing to harm the American people. And so, yeah. I will continue to call for his resignation. He does not deserve to serve the American people, because he doesn't understand what service means. Wow. Take that a little further, because we hear about Scott Pruitt, we hear about what's happening in HUD, we hear about the White House Correspondence Center, we hear about all of these things. There is so much noise coming out of D.C. right now, and sometimes it feels overwhelming how much noise is coming out. In your opinion, what are the things that we should really be paying attention to, and what are some of the things that have sort of grabbed hold of the attention of voters and of the American media that we need to maybe let go or leave alone and move on to more important things? Well, I think that there is such a bombardment and an assault on the American people. It's important, as the young people say, to stay woke. Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, fighting uh, to get rid of assault weapons uh, mm -hmm. in this nation, uh, giving young people the opportunity to be educated in a gun-free zone, um, mm -hmm. and whether it's you know, fighting to make sure that we maintain Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, we need to keep our eyes on the tax scam that right. was just perpetrated against the American people, mm. that uh, has given uh, the much-needed tax revenue that we rely on to give uh, a support to the most vulnerable in our society, but are now mm -hmm. given multi-million dollar tax breaks to wealthy individuals and corporations. Mm -hmm. When you drain the coffers to give uh, tax breaks, kicks, kickbacks, if you will, mm -hmm. to the wealthiest Americans, and then say, oh, well, we can't afford any longer, if we're going to balance the budget, to give people uh, SNAP. Mm -hmm. or we can't afford to build and invest in infrastructure that would bring us broadband, affordable housing, mm -hmm. because these individuals have decided to drain our coffers to line their pockets. That's mm -hmm. what we need to pay attention to, how we're going to survive economically going forward. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the economics of this nation mm -hmm. should be something we focus on. Right now, the Republican Party is going through a meltdown. Not a whole lot is coming out that is right. being signed by Donald Trump. What we've seen signed by him, however, has been the gravest uh, robbery. Mm -hmm. on the American people that we've seen in a generation, and it has implications not only for today, but for generations to come. Absolutely. So we've got to keep our eyes on that, because that's the justification for going after Social Security, for mm -hmm. going after uh, Medicare and Medicaid, the pillars of what makes us a very unique civil society in that we provide for our retirement. We provide mm -hmm. for, in our elder years, having uh, uh, quality health care and mm -hmm. providing for those who may be ill but don't have the means to pay for uh, the type of care that they need to keep them alive and well. And so, that's what I would say to your viewers today. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes on the dollars. There's right. a big money movement going on right now, mm -hmm. and it's to take away from the average everyday American, mm -hmm. because 83 percent of the tax bill is going into the pockets of right. the most wealthy in America. Wow. It's so great to have you here today um, talking to me and also who I'm your constituent, yes. obviously, but also talking to so many of your constituents, hopefully, who will be tuning in to this interview. But congressional approval right now is about 18 percent. 
at 18 percent for congressional approval. It's not the lowest in recent memory, but it's also not great numbers. Is the public justified in feeling dissatisfied with Congress right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have Republicans running the House. Republicans running the Senate and Republicans running the White House. Mm -hmm. They have all three branches of government. And look at what they are seeking to do. They are seeking to undermine the interests of the American people. Right. So how Flint do Democrats, still doesn't have clean water. They don't. And right? Michelle just said that right? <laughs> the other night. Okay. She, Flint still doesn't have clean water. So how do Democrats come up against that? How do you fight that when we they have every branch? We mobilize. We organize. We keep people informed and engaged in the fact that we have got to turn the page on this chapter of American history. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, in the midst of a battle for the soul of this country. And the, Rep the Democrats have put forth the most progressive agenda uh, in, in a generation mm -hmm. uh, to address moving this nation forward, whether it's a trillion-dollar infrastructure bill mm -hmm. that invests in the rebuilding of our nation, creates jobs for Americans, and Bring, bringing those revenues back into our coffers to be able to invest in other things like public school education that Betsy DeVos seeks to privatize, mm. like uh, opportunities for small business to be able to be uh, the robust employers of our uh, community residents who are mm -hmm. looking for opportunities to use their talents. We are moving forward with an opportunity agenda because it's so needed right now. Right. Climate change, we know that it's here. We need to be using all of our talent mm -hmm. to develop, whether it's through technology or, or, or just through our sheer grit and intellect, ways in which we're going to protect the American people in the wake of climate change. Puerto Rico still doesn't have electricity. Right. Why are they still uh, putting up electric wires overhead when we know that they will ultimately be hit yeah. again by a hurricane. Absolutely. Why not make the investment now to embed those lines underground? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we looking at what the latest, uh, in, in terms of modern uh, 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 mechanisms we have to be able to protect ourselves mm -hmm. and, at the same time, uh, cut back, eliminate our carbon emissions that are accelerating mm -hmm. what we know is climate change right. right now. There's so much work to be done in this mm -hmm. generation, and, th and the Democrats are pointing to that each and every day, in every hearing that we have against a regressive Republican Congress that is, is looking for a way to continue to generate revenues at the expense of and, and, and right. to the demise of, 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 of our planet and of our communities. Wow. Well, Congresswoman Yvette Clark, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed talking to you. Um, and I hope to have you back at some point so that we continue having these conversations. Thank you so much for coming. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for having me, Ashley. Fantastic. We've done a couple segments now on blockchain and cryptocurrency, but if I met you at a party and you asked me what it's about, I'd probably fail that quiz. I'm still fuzzy on what it is and how it works, but that's okay, because these days you can't throw a brick in Brooklyn without hitting someone who's working with cryptocurrency in some capacity, or at least interested in it. And now we have someone on the show, not only one of those people, but someone who convenes folks from all over at the upcoming Ethereal Summit who are similarly engaged in the future. I'm hoping he can shed a bit more light and give me some knowledge that sticks about what some call an investment opportunity for the ages and others call a scheme. Jesse Grushak, thanks so much for being on 112BK. My pleasure being here. So, first question. I want you to not feel too special. <laughs> we ask everyone who comes on this show to talk about blockchain or cryptocurrency what it is, and why we should care. Okay, um, so 
Blockchain is essentially a new data structure for computing. Mm -hmm. um, so the first blockchain that came into existence was Bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, in 2009. And so Bitcoin essentially created digital currency um, in a new way, kind of. So before mm -hmm. this, we were able to create digital currencies, but we had a problem because there was a lot like there you could copy it right you could create duplicates of us because it was a digital file and right. there was only one singular entity in charge of that so you know if you look at um, some of these previous current cryptocurrencies or digital currencies before Bitcoin mm -hmm. um, that was kind of some of the issues and so Bitcoin basically uses blockchain technology to create a digital ledger so a, ben a bank book so mm -hmm. that not not just the bank has, but everyone has. So right. we have essentially tr record of all the transactions from you know from me to you, from you to me, um, spread out all over the world. So now we don't have to rely on a single person or a single entity to be in charge. Now that sounds nice. But we can rely on everyone to c come together and secure this network. Okay. So. Bitcoin is the first. Right. And Ethereum, which is what we build on at Consensus, is, it takes that concept of a digital global ledger that mm -hmm. we were just talking about and kind of, you know, goes past just the money aspect. So right. it's not just a bank book, but it's essentially a, a book of all of these agreements that are going on, the digital agreements that can happen within um, computing. So, so it's like a contract. Exactly. So there's a lot of contracts. So what we call in Ethereum is they're called smart contracts, and mm -hmm. they're not actual contracts. They're right. they're not legally enforceable. They're essentially small chunks of code that act as agreements between people or between machines or between mm -hmm. you know anything really. Um, and instead of individuals executing those agreements, mm -hmm. the computer does. Oh. So we no longer need this centralized entity to say you know. Ashley, you know, did this and she should be paid this, the computer would say, you know, if this happened, Ashley gets paid because that's what's written into the rules. Wow. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm starting to get this a little <laughs> bit. Why is this better than cash or the contracts that we have now? Even though, you know, I guess technically those contracts are legally binding and these are not. But it adds a level of objectivity, I'm guessing. Like it no longer is. Mm. When we look at cash, right? Cash is simply an abstraction. Um, so you know, when when I pay you a dollar, it's it's me saying that, you know, the U.S. government with their f army and their full force backs the value of that, mm -hmm. right? It used to be worth a dollar of gold. That's no longer the case. That stopped in the '70s, much right. to some people's surprise. Right. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, so we're relying on governments, right? We're relying on, you know, different systems. And, uh, you know, in the United States, we have a pretty stable currency. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look around the globe, there are places that, that don't, right? If you mm -hmm. look at Zimbabwe, if you look at Venezuela, these places, you know, underwent hyperinflation um, and don't have the ability, the people kind of lose that ability, that spending power, even if they're doing the same thing. Um, and so if we're looking at, you know, why cryptocurrencies matter, it's, it's we live in a global world today. Right. You know, and it, we, we need do. And it, a digital world as well. You know, everything is mm -hmm. connected. Um, but when we look at currency and the way money is spent on the Internet, it's still going through the same way it was before we were digital. Right. You know, even if you're using a credit card and it feels digital, it's still kind of manual. And, you know, if you yeah. want to take money out of the internet, it's going to take you two to three days for that to hit your bank account. And <sighs> Which sucks so bad. It's, it's like, annoying, right? You're right. That is so annoying. And I hate it so much. And I, I might be sold on cryptocurrency just because that's the case. And I won't have to wait three days to get money that I have right now right. and put it in a different place, which is just wild and doesn't need to be the case. <laughs> but I, I have a couple more questions about cryptocurrency, that things that I'm a little concerned about. Um, I don't even know if concern is the right word. Interesting. It in. Can anyone found a cryptocurrency? That's my first question. And two, like, how many can there be? So anyone can found a cryptocurrency, right. um, and that's kind of one of the beauties of these system is it, it's mm -hmm. you know the barrier to entry, for, I guess, for creating currency or for raising capital or all this has been lowered uh, significantly, right? Um, which makes it more accessible. Mm -hmm. So. Anyone can create a cryptocurrency, but in order for it to have value and, you know, you have to have something, it has to be backed or, you know, have something that people believe in, right? It has to have these reasons, right. you know, you have to convince a bunch of people that this is valuable. 
Right. Um, and if you can do that, then you can have your own currency. How can you convince people that, you know, before the cameras were rolling, before we sat down for the official interview, one of the things that we talked about is the fact that there's a pretty steep learning curve um, for learning how to work with and yep. within the cryptocurrency industry. So, I, you know, I got to say, as a black queer person in Brooklyn, I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm wondering, are people like me just going to miss out? Are we going to be Bitcoin broke? Are we going to be Ethereum broke? I don't think like, so. Or can we find our way into it? I, you know, I mean, the technology is accessible already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not that accessible, I'll, I'll say that. You know, it's, it's, there is still a learning curve. Um, right. You know, it's not to the point where it kind of has faded and the technology has faded into the background just yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to get there. I think you're going to be using blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies without ever realizing it. Yeah. But, you know, and to your answer your earlier question about how many of these can there be, there could be thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions even, right? Right. You know, we can have, you could have a, a currency just for the BRIC studios, right? You could mm -hmm. have a currency just for Brooklyn, where, you know, if you're doing community service around Brooklyn, you could be rewarded with currency and it creates this mm -hmm. local economy that runs essentially on a currency that only exists in this area. Wow. But we can now take that and also extrapolate investment or involvement to a global scale because it is digital. How do we help people avoid, because you know, anything having to do with currency, money, goods, getting that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Inevitably, scams and schemes show up. Absolutely. And they undermine people's belief in the process, they undermine people's access. Like, how do we keep our eyes peeled and know the difference between something that's real that we want to try and get involved in and something where somebody's really just trying to get money from us? Absolutely. Uh, so I think if you look at this stuff as an investment, Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to say to yourself, then, am I a venture capitalist, right? Mm. You know, am I going to do the due diligence required to understand this, to understand what I'm investing in? Right. Um, granted, there are more proven ones like Ethereum, like Bitcoin. You know, some of the more established currencies that you can invest in without having to do a lot of that research. Mm -hmm. Granted, I still think you should know what you're doing. Right. Um, but if you're doing it strictly from an investment perspective, you know, it's an investment, right? So you mm -hmm. should always be prepared to lose an investment. Yes. Um, so, you know, I would not recommend that anyone goes out and mortgages their house to, to invest right. in this stuff. You know, that's, that's definitely not what I would advocate for. If you do that and, you, you know, it goes up a bunch, then congrats. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you are taking a significant risk. So right now it's for the people who have a little room to play. It's for people that have a little room to play. Uh, also, you know, but at the same time, you could put $10 in if you want. You could put $5 right. in. And if it goes up 10 times, great. You know, if it goes down a couple bucks, then you know, you've lost what you could afford to right, lose. You know? That makes sense. In the minute we have left, tell me about the Ethereal Summit. Yes. So Ethereal came about because a lot of us had gone to these crypto conferences. We've gone to, you know, spent a lot of our time in, in the blockchain world and didn't feel there was enough connection to culture, didn't feel like there was enough connection to the larger world, really. You know, this stuff has the potential to impact almost every industry. Wow. And if we're going to do that, we need to bring the people that are the best in their industry without blockchain into this space mm -hmm. and work with them and help them understand it or, you know, find a project to work on together where we can bring this into our world and right. we can help make it the best that we can be. Because if we start over and try to say, you know, all right, where you want to redo, you know, for us, the music industry, mm -hmm. you know, and we don't bring any music experts in, chances are we're not going to be very successful. Right. You know, so yeah. that was the kind of concept behind Ethereal. Um, we did the first one last year in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. We have the second one coming up in a couple weeks um, in New York, and we did one in San Francisco and have done a little smaller offshoots. Where will the one in New York be and what time? The one in New York will be at the Knockdown Center, mm -hmm. and it will be on Friday, May 11th, and Saturday, May 12th. And I think it starts around 9 or 10 a.m. Um, and it's basically a full day of some of the, you know, leading experts in their fields, some, mm -hmm. you know, some global experts in governments. Uh, we have a really diverse group of people. There's going to be sessions on understanding the stuff, on understanding mm -hmm. how to utilize it, how to do design thinking with blockchains. How so to do I'll be there all is what I'm stuff. hearing. What I'm hearing is, Ashley, you need to come to the Ethereal Ashley, Summit. I would love for you to be so there. So you know what's going on. I'm going to be there. 
thank you so much for My being pleasure. here. I really appreciate your patience and your knowledge and your time. Absolutely. Fantastic. My we'll pleasure. have you back sometime because I want to keep talking about this. <laughs> and that's it. That's the show. We're so happy you could join us. Hope to see you tomorrow when Jarrett's back to talk with public advocate Letitia James. And then we'll talk Brooklyn weddings and plus-size brides. Bye-bye. Thank you.